All right, boys and girls, I am happy to be here with the one and only James Urbaniak uh, talking to us tonight uh, on, uh, I guess we have to acknowledge a little bit of a sad occasion with yes. the expiring of the great Venture Brothers TV show. Uh, James, Paulina Inc. and I have been uh, sharing and reminiscing about your show uh, over the past several days. Um, and we have to say thank you so much, first off, for all the joy you oh, have given us during well, the period thank you. of the show. It is You're such welcome. a phenomenal achievement. And, and thank you so much for everything you've given us. But I have to ask, is there any hope at resurrection? I mean, really, I, it's, well, at this period in time, I could really use some joy in my life, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Especially my, with the cliffhanger. Yeah, uh, my feeling is sort of my feeling about show business in general. Uh, one learns not to expect anything to happen. And then if something good does happen, that's a nice surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, that's, so that's how I kind of feel. I'm not really privy to the specific discussions. I know that there has been talk of Jackson and Doc, who are, you know, created and run the show, uh, of there maybe being a possibility of some sort of, not a season obviously, but some sort of finale special or something. But uh, I don't really know. And I know, I don't think they were terribly optimistic about that. And I think it, it was sort of the old situation. It's, it's an oft told story. I think there were some changes at uh, the network and uh, you know, decisions were made. Some uh, executive <laughs> whose baby it was moves to a different place. It's actually I true. Know. I know that one of the executives who sort of shepherded the show from the beginning had left about a year ago. And when mm -hmm. I saw that news, uh, that was a little bit of a red flag. <laughs> and then I got the news a few months ago, but we were sort of waiting to announce it. Uh, and then when Jackson uh, decided it was time to sort of let people know. But that would be great. And, you know, uh, anything's possible. Okay. Well, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll, ask a, I'll ask one more technical question before, uh, before I, uh, we actually get into some fun things. But um, one of the things I wondered about this show is, it's such an artistic achievement. It's so impressive as uh, an animation product, a musical product, you know, the, the score and, and everything. Yeah. Is, is this just sort of a situation where, because you all were so much ahead of time in charting this new path that has since been embraced by other TV shows and, and other networks, that in a sense, you were kind of a victim of your own pushing the edge of what could be done with animation and telling stories that would move people uh, and uh, having art that even though it only shows up for a scene or two is the kind of thing that people would want to, you know, put in a poster on their wall versus, you know, computer generated right. animation and the like. I think it's funny, it's, it's sort of lovely to kind of think about the show being a sort of early prestige TV show, but <laughs> in a way it's true. It because, really is. Uh, it's, it, you know, as you know, the pilot was 17 years ago and there's a, because it's, because the show really has such a small staff and, but is such a detailed piece of work, the turnaround between seasons was so long. But yeah, I can see, I don't know if that factors into the reason that it was canceled, that, well, we've, this kind of stuff is out there anymore. It's not that special anymore. <laughs> but it was certainly, uh, I think it's certainly up there uh, with those uh, sort of, for lack of a better word, prestige shows. Mm -hmm. and, and because it's sort of, um, it's it's an animated show and and it's not taken to be uh, quite in that class. But those who know know. Uh, the funny thing about the show is, uh, as you know, Ben, is that my experience is that there's either diehard fans or people who'd never heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> and so and the diehard fans, I guess, are re relatively small in terms of a national audience. But they they've been consistent and they've always been there. So it is sort of the little show that could in a way. Mm. 
But I, I, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, don't have too many theories about why it's not on anymore. I want to I mean, give, that's a nice way to frame it. <laughs> I want to give Paulina a chance to ask a question, but I would point out Please. that just if you're, if you're thinking about it as a, as kind of a prestige show, the truth is that when you came on and look, I'm, I'm about twice Paulina's age, not quite. And, and we are sort of two uh, uh, separate generations of appreciation of this show for that reason. Uh, but the, at the time it came on, the idea of serious and adult and humorous, you know, sort of uh, animation that had a storyline and a level of writing quality to it that would draw you in and actually move you emotionally at points uh, yeah. while also entertaining was basically unheard of. I mean, outside of the realm of I guess the anime universe, which I'm less familiar with, but it like the, the point true, being yeah. that like without Venture Brothers, there is no Bojack Horseman. There is no Rick and Morty. There is none of this like prestige animation. I suppose, today. yes. It, I think it definitely had an influence on, on if only on what could be done, mm -hmm. you know, with that kind of show and that uh, specifically Adult Swim. I mean, Adult Swim is very influential. Uh, programming block. Uh, I, I, like Space Ghost is one of the most influential shows of all time, in my opinion. <laughs> mm -hmm. The kind of uh, Space Ghost's approach to interviews, you will actually see in sort of mainstream documentaries now, where for a sort of humorous beat, they'll cut to a story or something going, um, uh, and then they'll cut to something else. <laughs> and that sort of editing technique was really invented by Space Ghost and it's become so mainstream, it's almost hard to remember that someone invented that. Uh, but yeah, and I think when Venture Brothers started, there was a kind of house style that Adult Swim had, which was, it's a super cliche, but this, this, this idea of sort of stoner comedy or sort of you know, uh, wacky avant-garde stuff. But from the beginning, Venture Brothers ha always had a very classical sort of narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think the fact that it lasted that long and that, that the show, the word I've always used when I talk about it as the show went on is it, it, it expanded. The universe expanded, the depth of character expanded. And uh, I think that expansion was very exciting and definitely, I think, open the door for that kind of storytelling and animation. Uh, I, I, yeah. Uh, but you're right, like it, anime had been doing that for a long time, but it was specifically sort of what adults, the door that opened when Adult Swim started uh, is, uh, it's kind of exciting to have been a part of that history. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm basically, my, my, my energy is kind of optimistic and positive <laughs> <laughs> right now in, in, you know, saying goodbye to the show. Alina, go ahead. Um, it's so interesting to hear about how Venture Brothers had impacted the television landscape. I started watching it. This was my quarantine binge show. I, stumbled upon it a few months huh. ago and just really so you're a very obsessed. recent uh, very recent fan fan oh that's i'd great. heard i'd seen a few clips on the internet of highlight reels but nothing i started i finally started watching it under lockdown Did you and watch well, they put it, it all on hulu so they put it all on hulu. hulu yeah the hulu also took out the swears and like the uh i noticed i noticed that on my rewatch it was bothering me <laughs> <laughs> Which I actually have mixed feelings about. I think there's there's some extra comedy in the bleeps sometimes. Yes. But uh... I, some jokes are <laughs> worse because sometimes the inappropriate content adds to the humor. But there are some things where it's honestly funnier left up to the imagination a little bit. Yeah, yeah. There are a few things so. I probably shouldn't reference because my parents watch these podcasts <laughs> right. that are coming to mind at the moment. The other funny thing that is true is because it's been on so long is that a lot of people tweeted to me like I grew up at the show like people who were literally kids or young teens when it started and uh, that's that's certainly been uh, an interesting thing to think about uh, and there's actually at least one person who started out as like a college age fan of the show who used to write into my live journal back when I had a live journal uh, sort of before Twitter became a thing and she ended up working for the show uh, okay. in the art department so that was kind of great <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering about the trajectory of the show. Over the past 17 years, it, the show seems to have moved away quite a bit from the Johnny Quest homage to this m sort of more of its own thing. How, in your experience, has like the show changed from the episodic to the serialization and kind of drifting away a bit from the more direct parody? Yeah, I think it's just what I was talking about, the way that the world of the show just uh, enlarged and uh, and deepened uh, in a way. Uh, I think there was always, even from the beginning, it was very dense. And, and the jumping off point was that there's this Johnny Quest style family. Uh, the great joke of the show from the beginning was basically Dr. Venture is essentially a Johnny Quest figure who's now grown up <laughs> and can't live up to his boyhood uh, heroism and stands in the shadow of his dad. And that's always been part of the DNA, the show that's always been there. But then the, the it wasn't that long before the show went, got way beyond the sort of parameters of Johnny Quest. <laughs> and for me, each season, uh, getting the new scripts was really exciting. Just, uh, you know, just the way it consistently delivered and how uh, even Dr. Venture himself, there were little hints of, <laughs> of his humanity, flawed, flawed as it might be. Well, he was uh, always so, uh, one of the things that I liked about him is that he was so, he would be so much of a downer, a jaded pessimist when he was dealing with the hassles of family life. I was actually rewatching the first three episode arc of the final season yeah. as preparation for this interview, which I think is a phenomenal arc and has just so many funny elements in it, particularly yeah. uh, uh, Clancy Brown as Red Death. And, and but there's, one this, the one, there's this one image where like everyone is, you're, you're riding up this escalator towards the problem and, and, uh, and Rusty Venture is just sort of standing there with his arms crossed in the middle of all these people like ready to have a fight or do something, you know, significant. And he's just so over it. At the same time, he's kind of a perpetual optimist. He is in his funny way. That's very true. Because he yeah. sort of gets into these schemes and ideas. Uh, uh, his, the, the Coen Brothers <laughs> reference jumping out of the window is just like a total like you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go into this full bore and this is gonna work and it's gonna be amazing and it doesn't even matter that I'm you know piggybacking on my brother or something like that I'm gonna be great. yeah he gets excited about his new schemes one of my favorite sort of one-off jokes was him <laughs> deciding he's 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 going to have a, a little rendezvous with the uh, the Black Widow lady. Oh, to, yes. Uh, who, whose, whose reputation is that she uh, seduces and kills men. And he figures, well, I can get the seduction in, and then I've got this support system that'll help me from being killed. <laughs> and he's genuinely gung-ho about that plan. <laughs> Say what you will about it. And of course, he fails at it. Yes. Uh, uh, on every level. But uh, he still gets a little spark going. Uh, you I, know? <laughs> I love, to the fact that this is a show, I mean, you know, and, and you could do, you could actually write like psychological analyses of these. But I'm sure it, they will. It, but the, the relationship between him and, and his dead father uh, yeah. is at the core of this show in so many ways. And it, it makes you pause for uh, reflection on the way that you view the gargantuan heroes of your youth as they're depicted in animated form. Um, and and I find that to be really interesting in terms of someone who's held up as this idealized version of the of the all American genius scientist, you know, philanthropist uh, kind of demigod, uh, and being revealed as being this really terrible father <laughs> and, yeah. and not a good friend and and a lot of and other. He kind things. of makes Rusty look like a good person. <laughs> he really does. <laughs> That's a nice way to think about it. The other thing that occurs to me is that all these sort of psychological pathologies <laughs> that the characters are going through are very cyclical. The show really has this sort of cyclical quality where in a way it's sort of 
you can almost justify the last season as the final season because in a sense it's just going to keep going mm -hmm. uh and there are variations on these cycles but uh <laughs> i kind of feel like they're still out there i do i do i feel like the the characters are so strong that i sort of have the feeling that they're still out there going through these dr venture still going through this endless cycle of uh thwarted ambition mm -hmm. uh, and bitterness. <laughs> but then he'll find a little spark again and try again. And, you know, there's that, like there's Samuel that. Beckett said, you know, fail, then fail better. <laughs> <laughs> Pauline, did you have something? Oh, um, on the subject of um, venture and failure, um, it seems to be a ma I know it's been discussed a lot that failure is a major theme of the show. And um, do you th what do you think success would actually look like for Rusty? No one seems to embody failure better than him, except for maybe the monarch, but even he wins sometimes. Um, what do you think success would look like for Rusty? And do you think it would be atta actually attainable? I think, uh, well, I think Rusty would need some therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I think for Rusty, success would be some sort of self-awareness. A little more self-awareness, not so much triumphing over the science world and uh, fighting arch enemies. And I, I, I think that would be an interesting place to get to. <laughs> uh, I don't think Dr. Venture's ever really gone to therapy or uh, tried to deal with his, these issues. Uh, the question is, would he be aware of that as success? Because I, I think, I think it would. I think that that if he could just have a little more self-awareness about why he perpetuates these mm -hmm. behaviors, I think that would be a great success, but I don't know that he'd ever achieve it. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the process of working on the show. You had so many great guest stars during the uh, course of the run. Uh, clearly it was very popular with maybe some of the most creative and interesting yeah, uh, you know, voice actors and even non-voice actors, Taika Waititi and you know, whatever you know, people who would show up who were clearly you know loved the show. Uh, did you have any opportunity to do readings with them? And and what was the creative process like in terms of talking about the different characters and their progression? Because again, you know, I go back to the point where like when this started, the idea of a, a cartoon show that could move you and entertain you and make you laugh and also make you feel sadness was not something that was very popular. And now it seems like there's something like that that's coming out, you know, with regularity. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, the, the recording, except for a, a few times the first season, uh, everyone records separately. And Jackson directs the show and, and different animated shows work differently. Some do have you in the booth together, but, uh, Everyone records separately, and Jackson is a very meticulous director. So when, when I'd be in the booth, he would have very specific ideas about the mood and tone uh, of the scenes. And he would read the other characters, uh, and I would do Dr. Venture and the Phantom Limb now and then. Yes. Um, so one doesn't really interact with the other actors. And now and then, if I would be leaving a booth, I might run into Patrick Warburton. Although like the first three years of the show, I lived in New York and he was in LA. So I wasn't even in the same room with Brock uh, <laughs> when we recorded. <laughs> I wasn't even in the same state. Uh, but um, so for me, the, it was just contact with Jackson. Uh, and I wasn't really some of the other actors are friends of mine, but I, I, I don't remember really talking about the show with them mm -hmm. outside of being in the booth. So it's it's all sort of uh, Jackson's very masterful uh, puppetry. <laughs> where do you actors. think that what do you think that <laughs> that genius comes from for him? Because it's I mean, it's just such a unique vision and informed by so many pop cultural references, including ones that I didn't even get because oh, yeah. I didn't grow up on these shows. That type and, of thing. And a lot, uh, there were many times where I had to ask him and Doc what, the, what a reference. Uh, that makes me to. feel better. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite as fanboyish as they are in terms of sort of fantasy and science fiction genre stuff. 
And even, I mean, I, I am, I have my own obsessions, but they don't always uh, align with their obsessions. Mm -hmm. um, but wait, now, what was the question before I went off on that tangent? Uh, just, just, just that it, it seems to me like they had to have, they had to share some of this inspiration with you all. Oh yeah, we're, I think, I think they're just both natural writers and it's just one of those happy situations uh, like Paul McCartney meeting John Lennon, if I may be allowed a comparison <laughs> sure. of two guys who just meet at the right time and share these obsessions and talents. And I just, I think Jackson is a natural writer from the ground up. Like he started as a, he is a, a, a cartoonist and he started in comics and the look of the show is, is based on his original drawings for the show. Uh, but he's just, he's a natural writer and it's, it seems like a very 20th, 21st century approach where there's a lot of art uh, that's, there's an engine to it that's based on one's obsessions and antecedents. But uh, what you do with those obsessions and antecedents is so personal that what you're creating is unique and of itself. And I think he's sort of in that tradition you know, of uh, like the filmmakers who started out in the 70s, who were the generation that grew up watching movies and, and, and uh, painters doing the same thing. Uh, just, I think there's a real tradition of, uh, of, of uh, it's, it's sort of fan- People based. who have a genuine vision. <laughs> Yeah, but but like it's not derivative. That's the thing. Yeah. Yes. There's 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 something that drives part of the engine of the show is things that have come before it and influences. But uh, he because he's such a genuine writer and creative brain, it mm -hmm. becomes his own personal thing. And so I think it's just I think he's just working in that sort of writing tradition. Uh, and uh, he's just a really talented guy and a very sweet person too. And has a lot of humanity. I think that's part of it is just, there's a genuine, there's a genuine interest in sort of the humanity of these characters. Mm. But it really is extraordinary. Yeah. Paulina? What, what he achieved. They are spectacular characters. Um, who are some of the favorite characters that you, I know you didn't get to interact with the actors, but that you got, who are some of your favorite characters to interact with? Uh, well, I mean, I love the back and forth with, with uh, Brock, with Patrick Warburton from the beginning, because he and I have such different energies. <laughs> you're basic, you're polar opposites, really. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although I do know, in fact, I, I, I knew Patrick before that, a uh, little sidebar trivia, mm -hmm. many years ago, good Lord, like uh, before a few years before the Venture Brothers started, Patrick and I were both in a live action pilot that never aired. So I had met him years ago, actually in real life, and he would agree with this, he's more of a kind of mellow beach bum than a, a sort of, uh, <laughs> than a sort of dangerous passive aggressive uh, bodyguard. <laughs> uh, but he found a, a certain energy that, that works for him, that people adore. I love that also, one of my oldest real life friends is Steve Rattazzi, who played Dr. Orpheus. Yes. And uh, amazing fact, when character. The, when the show started, I was sort of a de facto casting director. I sort of helped Chris with some, <laughs> fill out some of the roles. And some of the people uh, we brought in from the beginning uh, were people I knew from the theater world in New York, which I was very much a part of uh, back then when I lived there. So I love that character. That character just always brought me so much joy. He constantly um, cracks me up and every dramatic intonation that he gives to, you know, his famous frittatas yeah. <laughs> or what have you is And then in, in the latter years, like the great Kristen Milioti, who's really becoming kind of a well-known actress, uh, she plays Serena, uh, uh, yes. Dean and Hank's sort of romantic She was just friend. in uh, uh, Palm <laughs> Springs. Yeah, she was just in Palm Springs. Yes. And uh, she's really great. And I really love what she does with that character. And she is from the tri-state area. She grew up in New Jersey. So she, her attack on that New York accent is, uh, <laughs> is uh, experienced. She knows, she knows how to play that kind of energy. <laughs> 
I, uh, one of the things that I loved so much about the show was <clears throat> I started watching it when I was in college before the dawn of the, the internet wiki that would explain everything to you. Yes. So you actually had to do some work to figure out Very the good. references. <laughs> what was that like? Yeah, it was hard. <laughs> it, it, I, I it's a very dense it was show. Far more, far more challenging than you would imagine. So the Reddit first has been so helpful that show, for I had watch. to do some like work. Okay, I get that this is funny and I get this is something that someone watching this show would laugh at. I don't quite get it. So I need to figure out what the reference is to. Um, with, with the ones that came later, what I feel like is that they, they kind of had this layered reference approach where it was like on, on one level, we're doing a reference that's recognizable enough that someone who's seen Jaws will know they're doing sure. Jaws. On this other level, like they probably haven't seen Sharky's Machine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> and then there are the, then there are references that are even uh, oh more so, obscure, far so more obscure, obscure than like Burt Reynolds films from the seventies, where there's really references for like a couple people in the back of the room. Uh, those are often Doc references. Doc likes to really sub reference. Is and, there uh, one that's your favorite that falls into that category? Oh gosh, um, I think like when I can't remember a specific one, but when they mention like the look or the costume design of like an 80s MTV video. <laughs> I think there's one in this season where they said, we there look is. like we're in a living color video, which <laughs> yeah, the, really the, got me, living color, great <laughs> 80s band who did wear kind of bright colors in their videos, African-American band who, and there was just something about a living color reference because they just feel like a band of their time. Yes. Uh, and, and so, yeah, those were the references that always tickled me because I am sort of that first generation MTV generation mm -hmm. who uh, was watching that when it started. <laughs> I have to admit that, that about I have to admit that about thirty minutes ago, before we started this interview, uh, I watched a YouTube video of David Letterman from the nineteen eighties. Oh my God! Uh, it's on featuring, YouTube, featuring you me. Featuring you, you can find it. It has about seventy thousand yes. views. Uh, oh, I know. I don't. I don't like the video. Why don't you uh, like it? You look well, so funny in it. <laughs> you're like a. You're like a young John Mulaney. <laughs> oh, far from it. Far from it. I'm a rank amateur. Uh, um, Paulina, do you know about this? Oh my God. I did. It was pretty high up on the YouTube um, <laughs> well, search, yes. along with your own channel, which know, I have my own comments on your, some of when your I was, personal videos, which were hilarious. When I was a very young man in the early 80s, I was like 19. I'll preface this by saying when the Letterman, when Late Night with David Letterman started, I was college age and uh, there had been, not, talk about like Adult Swim, there had been nothing like that on TV. It was just yeah. a kind of comedy and they were sort of inventing something. And if you were a young viewer at the time, a lot of us felt a great sense of ownership and pride, proprietary <laughs> uh, uh, delight in that show and just its, it, the way it sort of deconstructed TV. And it was a very creative, very funny show. So I was obsessed with the show. Um, I was far from a professional actor. I was still living in New Jersey. I was going to a community college, but I wrote for tickets and I went with my friend Anthony. And the night before the show, I had, I'd watched the show all the time. So I'd seen the show the prior evening and Letterman came out and he told a joke and he fumbled on the words and he said, oh, forget it. And then he just moved on to the next joke. So the night I went, I'm in the studio and uh, he comes out, he starts to tell that joke again. He stumbles on the words. He said, oh, damn it. This is the second night in a row. I've screwed this joke up. And he kind of took a beat. And with the impulsiveness of youth, <laughs> I saw my moment. And I blurted out, can I try it? And everyone laughed. And then Letterman said, yeah, what the hell? Why don't you come up here? And then I'd done a lot of amateur acting. I was not a professional actor by any means yet. But as soon as I got on stage, I saw myself in the monitor and I got very nervous. And when I watched that, all I see is a very nervous young man. Uh, and then I, I myself then sort of fumbled through the joke. And I was aware it didn't go great. So as a sort of save, I did a sort of sarcastic laugh and sort of patted Letterman on the shoulder. And then he did a kind of, why don't you just get back up there into uh, the seats? And, uh, but at the time I was very delighted. 
And looking back, I realized that was very much something that happened on that show at that time. That's not something that would have happened in like Letterman's yeah. later years on CBS. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he, for me, for me, that was for me that was Conan O'Brien and like all the ridiculous. That's things true. Conan made. kind of took the torch. Yeah. That kind of uh, and, that kind of energy. But I will tell you. There's something very Rusty Venture about that moment. <laughs> Both oh, it, there is. The ambition of like, <laughs> I can do this. And then getting up there and being in the spotlight and being, okay, and failing, I kind of did like this. Rusty, and then, yeah. yes. <laughs> Basically, my feeling is any of us, if you had a video of you as a teen being awkward, you wouldn't want it all over the internet. But those are the times we live in. Yeah, <laughs> Paulina, did you have one? Um, one of the things that really drew me in Venture Brothers when I started watching it a few months ago was the guild of calamitous intent and just the sheer organization of villainy, which is so bizarre and still so completely unique in the way. <laughs> why would, why do so many superheroes and scientists and people want desperately want someone who will come and constantly thwart them and constantly foil their attempts at success. You see Dr. Orpheus and um, Billy the Quiz Boy and Pete White and so many others desperately seeking arches. It's just so incredibly random and hilarious. Yeah, like it's just, that's one of the great jokes of the show is that it's, it's really about a society. <laughs> You've bureaucratized. Yeah, and, and, and so, yeah, you're exactly. It's like this bureaucracy, but one, one either makes a living, there's, there's just making a living and then there's achieving excellence, which we all sort of try to do in our lives. And, but there, I think the guilds exist just for a base level making a living and we can perpetuate these rivalries. But that, uh, and th there is a thing where like, you do see it in the show where there, there is a sort of subtle mutual respect. <laughs> mm -hmm. They realize they, they need each other to sustain yes. this society and to sustain these livelihoods. And then if they're lucky to sustain their own sense of accomplishment. <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of like, what, what if all of these different things had unions? Exactly. You know, you know, and, and, so, and so, you know, it's, it's the Legion of Doom but then it's also the Legion of Doom, you know, local affiliate, you know, this kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there are bylaws. There are bylaws <laughs> exactly. and paperwork. They're, they're and, not and, honoring yeah. my dental plan. <laughs> it's really, exactly. you know, unfortunate. <laughs> I love the one like in the last season where there's I can't even remember what it's called. I think I wrote it down because I forgot. But it's some it's some new coalition that's like based in Canada. It's like the uh <laughs> You know, the, 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 the perilous, I, sub, I forget. Yes, I, I forget off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. By the way, Doc Hammer and I uh, were once at a convention and we took uh, questions. And then as a bit, we, there was a host and he, he did a Venture Brothers trivia question. And it was us versus the audience and the audience won. <laughs> just the point where like, I don't remember what that group was called or what this <laughs> character's name was or even well, what his relationship was. You were not, you were not, <laughs> I will say, you know, Rusty was not your only uh, voice in the series. You have a rare honor in, uh, in the history of animation, which is that you uh, have voiced David Bowie uh, I did, and which my is, yes, which is quite the, an honor, I have to say. Great joke that Bowie was a figure in the show for many years. Um, I feel like my Bowie got better as the show went on. I've I've said that I want to kind of George Lucas it and go in and change the voice, <laughs> improve my performance in the earlier episodes when I sort of hit my stride. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think I got better at that. And how then of you, course- How yes. did you do that? Like what, what, did you watch some videos of him talking to go about it? I just think it has to be a challenge because he's such an odd and very yes. specific character. The, the trick for me, and I realized this into the run of the show. At first I think I was doing a sort of generic English voice. Uh, then I realized that Bowie is from London and he has a London accent and then 
I sort of stumbled upon discovering that if you do Bob Hoskins' real voice or the voice he's done in movies where he's using his English accent, <laughs> he has a kind of Cockney working class English accent, not the Bob Hoskins and Roger Rabbit where he's doing an American accent, but say uh, his early British films, uh, The Long Good Friday, I think is one mm -hmm. where he, he's sort of playing a tough gangster and he's got a bit of rasp to his voice. But it's basically a, like a Cockney guy. He talks like that. But that those cadences are very London. So then what you do is you just kind of smooth it out. You posh it up a little bit. And then you've got Bowie talking about going on the Glass Spider tour. And that was my thing. It's, it's sort of a, uh, a slightly posh Cockney, if you will. <laughs> and I, I, I yeah. I, I'm not aware I, that, Mr., that the great Mr. Bowie ever saw the show or ever heard about that. But... Uh, I feel like I, I'm like all have, of us who didn't love David Bowie. <laughs> he, he consumed so much <laughs> random cultural crap. I just kind of feel like he had to have come upon, upon it. Um, but I but have, he did do, yeah. I have he made I, I have made fun occasionally of of uh, a friend of mine. Uh, with make way for the homo superior. <laughs> yes, make so. way for the homo superior. That's the thing where they like to throw in quotes from Bowie songs. <laughs> um, uh, no, go ahead. No, it's just that Bowie was such a, Bowie in life seemed like a supernatural figure somehow. So it made perfect sense that the show would <laughs> yeah. make him magical this sort of, of, yeah, this sort of magical figure. Uh, uh, yeah. Paulina, I know you must have some other <laughs> questions as well. I keep interrupting. It's like, I have so many. <laughs> but these are, this conversation is getting so interesting for me as a new <laughs> fan. <laughs> I love um, that you're a new fan too, and that you did you like totally binge it over the last few months? Over the did past you get through? few weeks. Yeah, amazing. It I is stumbled very upon it. Yeah, that's great. I, I don't know how. I really do wonder how people watched it over 17 years because there are so many callbacks and very densely packed jokes that I recognize. I can tell you that. <laughs> I gotta I say, like because you would always list. have to rewatch the previous two or three seasons yeah. and they were and sometimes sometimes that difficult bad. to find. <laughs> As an actor on the show, my experience was I would get the scripts for the new season. We'd go in and record over the course of a few, uh, th like three months or something, uh, record the season. Then it would be at least a year before the episodes were on the air. And by that time, I'd always, I pretty consistently had forgotten what I'd recorded. So when I watched the show, so much time had passed from the time I was in the booth that I was like a new viewer myself. Like, oh, I didn't remember that, mm -hmm. you know, everything. So I sort of watched it as a viewer too. And I had that same experience when I, had to, I would often sort of go back and check. <laughs> and then indeed, as the internet caught up with the show. So I, you know, you could check Venture Brothers Wikipedia Mm -hmm. And uh, remember <laughs> some of the, all these many threads and extraneous I don't know where characters. Our viewing would be without Reddit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but there are certain there are certain bits that I do think caught on to to a wider audience. Um, uh, people get the nozzle references. Yeah, kind of <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there are some little uh, catchphrases, if you will, memes yes. that came yes. out of the show. Yeah. So who, which, which ones <laughs> of those, if there is one or two that is yelled at you or said to you when people see you, uh, it, you know, is there something that comes up? Well, the most personal one for me is actually in the pilot, uh, where Dr. Venture <laughs> I think I can guess he's this discovered going he, the, he's referring to some bones he's discovered or something and he says they're robot bones <laughs> and that for me that became like the catchphrase through the whole every time I'd walk in the booth Jackson public would say to me they're robot bones and that was sort of the phrase that got me into the character uh, yeah so have that's you, that's my personal. Do you ever phrase. enjoy privately by yourself a red mocha cooler or is that <laughs> something that you? Yeah. I never actually tried. Did they? Did they? They do say the. There are recipes online for, for it. Yes, yeah. they do. Well, I mean, they say the recipe in the show, but there are also recipes <laughs> online to like. I think I've never try to actually make it had better. a red mocha cooler, and it's surprising that no one's offered me one because I go to, I. Uh, I have gone to Comic Con and Dragon Con pretty consistently, and people do give me, they give us gifts. The fans, uh, Jackson and Doc had a very, uh, a very open approach to sort of fan merch. 
mm -hmm. and fans would make and even sell I their own stuff. I was actually looking for, I have at least two of those t-shirts somewhere in a box. I could not find Oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not wearing one today, yeah, but no. I, I, my dresser is Paulina, full of Paulina, you don't know Venture this, but Brothers there was this series of limited edition t-shirts that they made where you could like, it was tied to the season and to the show. And so like you had to buy it before a certain amount of time. They're great. So I have a, I have a Guild of Calamitous Intent t-shirt somewhere and and a uh uh the the uh boy adventurer one with the light bulb on it i have that yes somewhere. <laughs> and there is a company that there was a company that made some official figurines there are little small action figures <laughs> that came out of the course of the years and i forget it was either that company or someone else adult swim came out with a very limited edition lunchbox which i own one of them there were very few of these made, but it's an old fashioned 1970s style uh, metal lunchbox with images from the show on it. Awesome. It actually has images of Rusty Venture, the idea that it was a, a, a lunchbox from Rusty. Because as we know, the, the, the Dr. Venture story is he was a boy adventurer who also starred in his own TV show. Yes, brought to you <laughs> by smoking. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and we do see the lunchbox on the show. I think in season three, yeah, Billy Quiz Boy has one. <laughs> one of my all-time favorite jokes ever on the show was he was arguing with the boys, uh, and um, <clears throat> about something. And uh, the point was that he was Rusty Venture and they were just his sons. And he said to them, well, maybe if there's ever a show called The Venture Brothers, you can have your own lunchbox. <laughs> or, <you know. laughs> such a great, such a great joke. They're not aware that there's a show called The Venture Brothers on The Venture Brothers. That's, that's the one reference they don't get. <laughs> uh, Paulina, do you have something else uh, before? I don't want to take up too much of your time, but go ahead. Um, is there any, there's so many pop culture references. We talked about it a number of the really deeper cut ones. Is there any reference that you would have loved to have seen that wasn't included in the show? Um, well, this happens very rarely, but uh, now and then, and it's only happened like two or three times, Jackson, when he was writing, would write to me and he would say, hey, do you have an idea for this joke? And there's, it's actually in the last season, they, there's a, some of the characters go to a diner and yes. there's a little joke where it's a Broadway a district diner and they offer like the side by side by Sondheim club sandwich <laughs> or something like that. And like a Patty Lapone melt. <laughs> and I was, he was like, I need some theater menu <laughs> jokes. And I sent him a list of like two dozen jokes. <laughs> and I think Patty Lapone was in there, but it wasn't the Patty Lapone melt, it was something else. And so I kind of half made the cut because I did suggest a Patty Lapone reference but he changed it. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I was disappointed <laughs> that I didn't get I, it. I, I literally just saw that episode because that's what Red Death orders and they say, you know, oh, you must be a regular or whatever. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I have to ask you, uh, it has to be challenging to be in this current moment as a creative, as someone who has you know, devoted their life to uh, doing so much in terms of acting and voice acting and the like, and to see the restrictions that are put in place. And I know that Paulina and myself, as constant consumers of media, are increasingly uh, very worried that we are going to be forced to watch reality television. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As, well, even uh, that, it's an open question what that's going to be like. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be Zoom shows. Yes. Um, are you doing anything? Have you thought about doing anything? Is Blumhouse going to like save us in this moment as, as they- Well, it's uh, funny, yeah, I actually, you know, cause I do regular acting as well as voice acting. Yes. And um, I, there are a couple of things that were booked and lined up before the quarantine started and that have all gotten uh, sort of pushed back indefinitely. Uh, I actually just got a message about one, which is like a TV, uh, a series where I would have a sort of recurring part and they're talking about tentatively starting in a couple of months, but it's all a very open question. So I really don't know what's going on with that. Theoretically, I would think you could make on camera stuff if it was presumably everyone would be checked. Yes. <laughs> would take a test. You'd make sure that you, I don't know how intimate the scenes can get with each other, but assuming <laughs> both the actors have a clean bill of health, I guess it would be safe. Meanwhile, then I've also done some 
animation, of course, is still happening, and most animation can be done is all done on computers anyway. So it's you know that's and I've recorded a couple of guest shots on some animated shows at home. Oh great! Uh, which I've sent in. Also, my wife works for a video game company. I did some voices for a game that they're making. So there's some of that can stuff. Can you and tell I'm, us any of those just so that we can appreciate the urban? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, she works for a, um, what, Bark is what kind of a game again, <laughs> darling? A shooter. No, but I mean, what, what, it's like Xbox or whatever, or? Oh, Switch. I'm switch, sorry. Switch. Oh, yes. Switch, great. I'm not yeah, as but... literate about the game world as my wife is because she does her for a living. <laughs> uh, yes, there's a there's a company called TikTok. No relation to the v TikTok video people. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's a game making, on Switch. They're making a Switch game called Bark, which is coming out, and I actually had to, I'm doing some voices on part oh, of that. And then there's like a there's like a kid show called Bubble Guppies that uh, I'm doing some voices on. Mm -hmm. And then personally, I can't give too much information, but for a few years I've produced. Uh, sort of little radio dramas, scripted podcast uh, plays. Yes, and I, I, I think I knew this. Yes, um, we may have. Yeah, texted I had a series before, yes. of them. There was I had a series called "Getting On with James Rubaniac," mm -hmm. uh, where the sort of device of that series was that it was ostensibly me, uh, James Rubaniac, talking to the audience. But each week we learn that James Urbanic is just a character and the given circumstances of his life change from week to week. Yes. So basically they were just standalone little plays where I used my own name, but the fun <laughs> of it was they were completely different scenarios. And sometimes we even went back in time. We did one where James Urbanic was a guy in the old West. <laughs> so I did that for a while, which was fun. The, the network, the podcast network that hosted that show went out of business. Uh, but my writing partner and I have written some new scripted stuff and we're sort of talking to a couple of networks about producing those and getting them up there. So I'll be tweeting about it, Good. but that's, that's taking up uh, my energy now is sort of writing some stuff that hopefully will be out there. Can I ask uh, your opinion, exciting. where do you think the industry will go? Like, I mean, just if you, if you're looking at it right now, you know, I think the fear of of someone like me and maybe someone like Paulina is that we uh, we love lots of quirky, interesting, independent content. And we're worried that the industry is basically going to be about whatever the Chinese middle class wants and uh, large sort of over the top explosions and uh, nothing that's really character driven or has, you know, he a wants. real depth of writing. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. So what do I'm you think sort about of, I'm very glass half full about these situations. I mean, that mm -hmm. is sort of my default <laughs> personality. But I feel like, like, I know that I'm not unique, that right now I'm trying to use this time to write and to write something creative. My, I have a writing partner and we write these radio plays. We're also writing a screenplay now, which is actually rather ambitious, which has sort of uh, car crashes and events happening mm -hmm. in it, but coming from a very specific uh, perspective. And uh, explosions. I feel like there's a lot of that probably happening out there. And, you know, uh, people have already, are already making like feature length movies that sort of use Zoom as a, mm -hmm. as a device. There's a horror movie out that, that did that. And I feel like I just, I, I, the answer is I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I, I feel personally uh, energized uh, and just sort of trying to use this time where we're all in our homes to create something. So I, I, I don't know. I feel like there's still an audience for personal, for lack of a better word, quirky stuff. And, I, you know, it's a big country and there's, a, and there's yeah. a lot of platforms out there, even if it just means putting something on the internet yourself. But uh, I think that's going to keep happening. I, I, think, I think that'll keep perpetuating itself. And then eventually people do put things out, you know, by themselves. And if there's an audience for them, then... 
people at companies who are just concerned with making money uh, <laughs> might yeah. fund more of that. So I, I, I'm sort of hopelessly optimistic about <laughs> the future of film Good. and TV, kind of because I sort of have to be because I've chosen to make my living in that business. <laughs> and one does, one does learn, like I said at the beginning of this, you know, just as a working actor, one sort of goes along assuming the phone's not going to ring. And then when it does ring, it's a nice surprise. <laughs> so that's just sort of the way I've oriented myself through my whole career is that, well, it's going to work out. I'm going to get a job. And that usually, if you put yourself in that position, that tends to be what happens. I'll but I know, it. for instance, that Jackson is already talking about, you know, plans for future shows. And, mm. and uh, so we'll just see. But I, I, I'm pretty optimistic, you yeah. know, because I feel like I don't have a choice. <laughs> Paulina is too shy to ask this question, so I'm going to ask it because I know it was hers originally and she didn't yes. include it. What is your opinion on what is a rusty venture? Why ah, did you give yes. me credit for that? <laughs> <laughs> you know my parents watched this. <laughs> I, I don't think you can really reveal it. I think it just has to be... I, I, I sided with Colonel Gentleman. She sided with uh, Brock, but you know, I mean. <laughs> I mean, I thought the funniest one was probably Shore Leaf, but Brock's no. is probably the most accurate. Now, this is an interesting question because if I recall correctly, this script basically, s s they start to suggest something and then it's yes, it's bleeped out. And in, and in Adult Swim, of course, it was bleeped out. So. But I don't know that they recorded anything that specific. Did, did they say what it is? Oh, there the is on YouTube. <laughs> there definitely is on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> but is it the is it clips from the show where the characters are I, actually I saying stuff? So. I, I mean, think so. I mean, Colonel Gentleman's involves a is involves a snorkel. And Tennessee <laughs> so. Williams. <laughs> Tennessee Williams. Uh, I think um, it starts with know, the Shore Leave and Alchemist debate, and there's a specific. Yeah. Yeah, I have to go with this sort of uh, this sort of yes, Virginia. There is a Santa Claus uh, yes, answer, yes. which is you know, as long as you can come up with something in your mind, that's a rusty bench. <laughs> <laughs> just the dirt worst, most disgusting thing you can yeah, think or of, or just the most uh, incongruous and avant-garde. Yes, that absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, James, for taking the My time pleasure. To, to join us today. Thank you. Go Team Venture. Thanks for your support. Yes, go Team Venture, <laughs> as we say. <laughs>